Schönen guten Abend. Ich darf Sie alle recht herzlich willkommen heißen in den Räumen der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung an diesem Abend zur Veranstaltung Africa Uprising, Protest- und Demokratiebewegung in Afrika, eine Kooperation zwischen Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung und der Deutschen Welle. Bonsoir, bienvenue dans les locaux de la Fondation Heinrich Böll pour la discussion publique Afrique Uprising, Mouvement de Contestation et Mouvement Démocratique en Afrique, une coopération entre la Fondation Heinrich Böll et la Deutsche Welle. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Ja, einen schönen Abend zu unserer Veranstaltung. Ich bin Claudia Siemens, ich arbeite in Afrika äh, im Department der Heinrich Böll Stiftung und schön, sehr viele bekannte Gesichter hier zu sehen und auch so viele. Wir haben heute diese Konferenz zu einer Zeit, wo äh, Afrika sehr viel über äh, Afrika berichtet wird, Marshallplan, Potenzial für wirtschaftliches Wachstum, Investitionspläne und so weiter. Die Idee des, äh, der Entwicklung Afrikas ist jetzt in Deutschland angekommen, des Aufstehens. Afrika. Es ist eine äh, Konferenz, die auch stattfindet äh, zu einer Zeit, äh, wo die Leute äh, auf die Straße gehen, protestieren für ein besseres Leben. Sie haben es vielleicht gelesen, äh, äh, 17 äh, Menschen in La Lucha, Demokratische äh, Republik am Lund, demonstrieren gegen Kabila, die sind verhaftet worden. Es gibt viele Beispiele. Wir hatten viele, viele solche Beispiele in den letzten Jahren. Wir hatten massive Proteste in Burundi 2015. Wir sahen da Fotos von Teddy Messina, Fotojournalisten, die heute Abend auch präsent sein wird. 2015 hat sie diese Fotos geschossen während der Proteste. Wir hatten massive Proteste in Äthiopien in den letzten Jahren, in der Republik Kongo, in der Demokratischen Republik Kongo. Da gehen die Proteste weiter und in vielen, vielen anderen afrikanischen Ländern. Das heißt, zu einer Zeit, wo dieses Aufstehen Afrikas in, 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 in Europa ankommt, gibt es auch diese Aufstände in Afrika. Und meist wird über diese Aufstände nur berichtet, wenn Menschen... Der Polizeibrutalität ausgesetzt werden, wenn Leute getötet werden, gefoltert werden. Aber man weiß eigentlich gar nicht, was machen diese Leute da? Was sind ihre Visionen? Wie organisieren sich die Aufständischen? Was sind ihre Pläne? Was sind die Herausforderungen? Wer sind diese Leute, die auf die Straße gehen, die blocken, die äh, twittern, die sich auch nicht fürchten vor Polizei und Staatsgewalt? Das wollen wir heute Abend hier diskutieren und äh, es freut mich sehr, dass äh, Dr. Dirk Köpp hier äh, die Moderatorin ist, die sich den Abend führen wird. Äh, sie ist die Leiterin der Redaktion Französisch für Afrika der Deutschen Welle in Bonn. Und damit möchte ich übergeben an Dr. Dirk Köpp. Wir fangen erstmal auf Deutsch im Moment an. Die Diskussion nachher wird aber auf Englisch sein. Also wie Claudia Simons gerade gesagt hat, mein Name ist Dirke Köpp. Ich bin die Leiterin der Redaktion Französisch für Afrika der Deutschen Welle. Wir machen ähm, viel Radioprogramm mit den Afrika-Programmen der Deutschen Welle, aber natürlich auch Social Media, Internet, ähm, inzwischen auch sogar Fernsehen. Das können Sie sich alles auf der Deutsche Welle Seite anschauen, wenn Sie mal möchten. Heute Abend geht es ja jetzt erstmal um was anderes. Ich will Ihnen ganz kurz sagen, wie der Abend ungefähr verlaufen soll, damit Sie wissen, was Sie erwartet. Wir werden zunächst, ich habe zwei Mikros, wir werden zunächst ähm, uns einen kleinen kurzen Film anschauen, den wir extra für diesen Abend produziert haben. Das heißt also, Sie haben hier wirklich die, die Premiere dieses Mini-Films. Ähm, es ist ein Film über die verschiedenen ähm, Proteste, die es in den vergangenen Jahren in Afrika gegeben hat. Es sind natürlich nur Beispiele. Der Film erhebt keinen Anspruch auf Vollständigkeit, sondern es ist einfach so, dass wir uns die äh, Proteste rausgepickt haben, wo man die besten Bilder hatte, denn das ist oft das Problem für die Medien ähm, im internationalen Kontext. Es gibt nicht immer Bilder von dem, was man zeigen möchte. Und nachdem wir den Film geschaut haben, werde ich die Panelisten hier hochrufen, Ihnen kurz vorstellen. Dann geht es mit der Diskussion los. Das wird 
denke ich, so ein bis anderthalb Stunden dauern, dass wir hier auf dem Podium erstmal diskutieren. Und danach sind Sie natürlich herzlich eingeladen, auch Ihre Fragen zu stellen. Wenn Sie mögen, nicht nur an die Panelisten, die dann hier gesessen haben, sondern auch noch an drei, vier andere Aktivisten, die ich Ihnen vorstellen möchte, dann am Ende der Diskussion, die auch ähm, heute und heute schon teilgenommen haben und morgen noch an einem Workshop teilnehmen werden, den Deutsche Welle und Heinrich Böll Stiftung gemeinsam organisiert haben. So, dann würde ich sagen, schauen wir uns erstmal den Film an. In a country like Kenya, democracy is, um, the answer depends on who you ask. But for me, really, it should be um, the power, true power to the people, and not true power to the people who rule or govern over us. tourner la page de ces dictateurs et de ces fils de dictateurs qui pensent que nos états sont leur propriété. Non, nous ne sommes pas dans un bongolant, nous sommes au Gabon. Ce n'est pas une monarchie, le Gabon. C'est une république. Avec la constitution, avec les institutions qui devraient fonctionner de manière républicaine, mais sauf que ces institutions sont prises en otage par une famille depuis 50 ans. Un certain moment, il faut taper du poing sur la table pour rappeler ces dirigeants à l'ordre, pour leur faire comprendre que ce n'est pas ce pourquoi vous avez été élus et leur rappeler ce que nous attendons d'eux. O sonho é de mudança. Eu não penso, por exemplo, em migrar para viver fora. Eu, eu espero que as condições aqui melhoram, oferecendo maior trabalho, reivindicando, participando ativamente, dando sugestões e, e apontando caminhos que podem representar a solução para construir uma Angola onde as pessoas podem ser felizes e se orgulharem de estar vivo. Das, ah. <lacht> vielen Dank. <lacht> ja, vielen Dank. Sie die natürlich ganz unterschiedlich sind, je nach Land, je nach Kontext, in dem äh, protestiert wird, je nach den Gründen, aus denen auch ähm, protestiert wird. Ähm, allen gemeinsam ist aber, dass die Leute irgendwie die Nase voll haben von den Bedingungen, so wie sie sind. Ähm, aus vielen Gründen, zu den Gründen kommen wir auch gleich ähm, noch ich wollte nur kurz dazu sagen, dass heute, was die Proteste angeht, auch ein besonderer Tag ist, denn heute vor genau zwei Jahren haben die Proteste in Burundi angefangen. Gestern vor zwei Jahren hat der Präsident dort ähm, angekündigt, dass er ein drittes Mal ähm, zur Wahl antreten wird. Das ähm, hielten viele Leute für nicht verfassungsgemäß. Und dann haben eben die Proteste angefangen. Leider aber ist es so, dass der Präsident auch heute immer noch 
äh, im Amt ist, dass es dafür 400.000 Flüchtlinge gibt, viele, viele Menschen, die ähm, ins Exil gehen mussten, viele andere Menschen, die äh, während der Proteste oder auch danach gestorben sind. Das ähm, ist natürlich ein bisschen traurig. Wir werden heute auch darüber sprechen mit ähm, einem der Panelisten. Und morgen ist auch... That's very sad. And we will be talking uh, about this with one of the panelists. And tomorrow is another special day, because in Burkina Faso, we have the uh, 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 lawsuit against Blaise Compaoré that was toppled in 2014 and who is charged with, uh, um, uh, with, uh, with really slaughtering uh, uh, people during these protests by sending the army uh, cracking down on these protesters, so bloody crackdown that was. Uh, and, and then we will have our panelists. We'll have ladies uh, first, Linda, Sarira. Uh, uh, Director. Maybe I continue in English, yeah. Linda, Linda Masarira is a Zimbabwean activist. Just let me check where I put you. Here, here, in this chair, yeah. <laughs> Linda Masarira is a Zimbabwean activist and a strong advocate for human rights, especially for women's rights. She engaged in public protests against the government uh, of Zimbabwe and she was part of the uh, hashtag 60 day occupation and the Tajamuka campaign. She has been arrested several times. This morning she told us that she has been arrested at least 10 times and once for only sitting in a park, she said. Um, we will talk uh, with her on Zimbabwe. Then I invite to the stage um, Sheikh Uma Touré from Senegal, better known as Chad. He <laughs> <You're here. laughs> He is a rapper and he founded the rap group Kurgi, which means um, the house in, in Wolof, uh, one of the languages, the most spoken language in Senegal. Um, and together with, uh, with friends, he also founded uh, the Senegalese youth led protest movement called Yonamar, We Are Fed Up. And the movement, um, which was originally started because of frequent power cuts, um, later on uh, organized youth protests and um, called youth to action, called youth to vote in the election in 2012. And this, this, vote, this vote led to the defeat of the President Abdullah Wad, who wanted to, uh, to be in power um, um, for more time. <laughs> and um, so this is five years ago. And um, now Yon Amar, um, is criticizing that the new president, Macky Sall, who has been in power for five years now, still hasn't fulfilled his campaign promises. So the protest continues. Then, <laughs> Teddy, I want you to come here. Teddy Mazina, uh, you already saw his photos here and there. <laughs> He's a photographer, a journalist and human rights activist from Burundi. Um, he has been living uh, in Belgium for quite uh, a long time. He, he came back to Burundi 10 years ago, but then he had to flee again because of the protests against Nkurunziza and the, the brutal and repressive re reactions from the Burundian regime. Um, because he, he uh, took part in the, move, uh, in the movement Alt au troisième mandat, stop, uh, stop the third mandate for President Nkurunziza. And then Zakaria Mampili, he's associate professor of political science, <laughs> of political science, African studies and in international studies at Vassar College in New York. And he has wrote a book, um, which is called Africa Uprising. <laughs> and so he is here today um, to explain us uh, the different types of uprisings um, who are taking place in Africa and maybe to give some theoretical background. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for being here. My first question, we go to you, Zakaria. Um, in your book, you say that protest is important 
even if it doesn't result in the overthrow of the criticized regime. Can you explain us why? Well, thank you all. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, there we go. Yeah, thank you all for coming out tonight and thank you so much for having me up here. It's a, a real honor to share the stage with these activists who have been really doing wonderful work across the continent and bringing some major transformations uh, to Africa. And I think there's much that we can learn from each other, uh, both in terms of what's happening in Africa, but also what's happening in our own countries. Uh, for me, the starting point for the book was a sense that many of the protests that have been unfolding in Africa since about 2005, what we call the third wave of African protest, and not received nearly as much attention as protests in other parts of the world. Uh, most of you have heard of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, a term that is often used to disconnect North Africa from the rest of the continent. And what we try to do is to show how the so-called Arab Spring protests are part of this longer history of African protest. And what we've seen consistently is that there are these common dynamics. Obviously, Africa is 54 different countries uh, with very different histories, very different dynamics. But there are also these commonalities that tie together these different struggles from which we can learn much. Uh, it is true on one level that there have not been as many successes in many countries in Africa that we would like to see. Uh, there have been mass uprisings in over 40 African countries since 2005. Only a few of these, like Senegal, like Burkina Faso, like Malawi, uh, like Tunisia, like Egypt, have actually led to the overthrow of specific regimes. And so it's a tendency to presume that this latest upsurge in activism has not produced the types of results as we have seen in earlier waves of protest across the continent. But I think one of the things that we have to emphasize at this moment is that we are in a moment uh, in which movements are facing a very complex political situation. Almost in every case that we have studied, uh, we have seen that movements have confronted massive internal and external challenges to their capacity to bring about transformation. Uh, movements have been crushed, I think as we'll hear today from all the activists. Uh, there's been tremendous repression brought against activism on the African continent. Uh, much of this is internally driven, but it has also been supported to a large degree by governments in the West, including my own in the United States. Uh, and I think as the international community, we have not paid as much attention uh, to the work of African activists in terms of bringing about the types of social change that we would like to see, and more importantly, that they would like to see. One of the things that I want to leave with, though, is that you know, despite the fact that most of these protest movements have yet to bring about the type of overthrows of, of regimes that they have sought to, do, to enact, that there are many other values uh, for what protest can accomplish, even if it does not lead to explicit regime change. Uh, most directly, as we've had these conversations over the past couple of days, uh, one of the things that has emerged most directly is that you know, once you uh, open up this door, once you sort of show people uh, that in most cases who have lived under dictatorial regimes for decades, uh, like our, our sister Linda here who has lived in Zimbabwe and has only one president her entire life. <laughs> this is not, not an unusual situation for many youth activists across the continent. And one of the things that is very dramatic now, and I think you can notice this if you talk to young people on the continent, is a sense that the fall of these regimes is inevitable. Their time is up. Uh, they will no longer be allowed to persist into the future. This is not to paint an overly rosy picture of the challenges that they confront, but to recognize that it is through protest that people start to imagine alternative futures. And we must recognize and, and congratulate the activists for, for forcing uh, us to acknowledge the transformations that are taking place, even if they have not brought about the types of changes we want yet. Thank you. Uh, Linda, I would like to know, um, as Zakaria said, you uh, have been knowing President Mugabe for quite uh, some time. <laughs> Do you, do, do you share the feeling or the point of view that um, protest is successful even if the most hated president is still in power and wants to be a presidential candidate ne next year again? Thank you very much. Um, what I can say is I think we have been successful in our protests in Zimbabwe because if we had not been successful, we wouldn't have been arrested last year, we wouldn't have been brutalized by the police and tortured in the same light. So it actually means that what we were doing actually made an impact on the regime. They didn't expect that because for a very long time Zimbabweans were docile and they just complained with no action. But we got to a stage where we we're asking ourselves till when are we going to just sit back and watch? We have all equally contributed to the dictatorship by not questioning, by not holding leaders to account, which is actually also a cultural problem. It's a cultural norm where in Africa leaders are not supposed to be questioned, where elders are not supposed to be questioned. But we are saying we are tired of dictators. 
dictatorship. We are tired of oppression. We are tired of the economic meltdown. We are tired about everything. I mean, basically, we are just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And now we have to make sure that we remove the Mugabe regime and usher in a new dispensation of capable, youthful leadership that will bring forth the democratic principles that we aspire and the economic freedoms and academic freedoms, which will build a better and brighter Zimbabwe. For quite some time, the youth were uh, were quiet in Zimbabwe and didn't really take part in the political life. What brought the change? Uh, what I can say is uh, what brought the change were leaders like me who said, we have had enough. There's so much fear of, an, of the unknown in Zimbabwe. People are even afraid of their own shadows because ZANU-PF had cultivated a culture that every next person is a state operative. And we had to go through a very long period where we were trying to demystify fear in Zimbabweans that we can actually do this. And um, a lot of times people ask me this question, you're always bitten, you're always in jail, why don't you stop this, what is the purpose? But I feel that I've got a generational mandate to change the course and the destiny of my country. We cannot keep on crying because right now Zimbabwe is in quagmire. The youth have got no future. They're not allowed to dream. Unemployment rate is at 98%. And we cannot keep on going on like that because there is absolutely no future and the future is in our hands and somebody just has to do something. So gradually when the men see a woman doing something, they're also motivated that no, we cannot um, let a woman lead us. And now they're rising and they also want to take part in the struggle. <laughs> I think that's in fact very important that women take part in the struggle. We saw that also in Burkina Faso, for example. We uh, we saw it in uh, in Burundi some time ago, but now you get the impression, or we get the impression, that the crisis in Burundi is no longer uh, interesting for for international media, for example. No one is talking uh, about Burundi. First, it's it's very difficult to, to speak after such a powerful rule. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Uh, international media is not going to sort out the problem of Burundians. Uh, international media comes when you die or when there's a big crackdown or where people are being killed or when they need news. But it's our people, it's we as activists, it's we as journalists that have to tell the world what is going on. So uh, we, had, we had our time and um, time will come when they will come back to see what we are doing. <coughs> But before we found we find uh, the, the right strategy, the right time to, to, to stop the regime, to kill people, to oppress people, to torture people, before we prepare the mind of our people itself, as she's saying, uh, you have fear, you have torture. Nobody can resist torture. Uh, nobody, everybody is afraid to die. Some people are afraid to die, not, not all, all, all of them. But the situation we are, where we are facing, especially in Burundi, We've been protesting for like six months. We had, uh, now we have like 2,000 people who have been killed. We have 6,000 demonstrators in jail. We have almost 500,000 people exiled in about two years. So now, now our movement is still exists. Uh, the media will come back when, when these 500,000 people decide to go back home, but we need to prepare them. And the role, with me, I found myself in playing a role that I didn't prepare. Me, I was just protesting as as a, as a citizen, you know, as someone who doesn't want to accept oppression, to accept that uh, the, the freedom of media, the freedom of expression, the, the freedom of movement is finished in your country. That you cannot en anymore, you're not anymore allowed to go home just to go to see your 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 small house. Uh, so it's not about international media, it's not about uh, the attention because there's so many things happening in the world. It's about how uh, people decide to stand and say no, and say no until the government collapses. As he says, what we have done we, uh, is it, it's, no, it's not enough, but it's half of the way. The, those presidents know that they are, they are finished. They are finished. They will pay, they will be judged. The truth will be, will, will be said and they will have to, to pay. And the, the, even the state will have to pay the people who have been killed by its guns. So uh, I think, I think, I think that 
the answer is that one. It's the, the, our own people who has to react even to. Mm. But, but 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 do you, do you want to say by by that that maybe maybe the Burundian people is not in inverted commas trying hard enough because I think no, they do. No, now we are asking people not to suicide themselves. The government is arming itself. It's still uh, having guns. They are killing whoever is trying to say so. It's, it's no matter now to tell people to go in the street again. They will kill them again. And uh, at the end of the day, they will come out to you and say, uh, "Now you, you can travel to go to Europe, but you're you're making uh, your, your your younger brother has been killed." So there's some other strategies to get rid of that kind of power. It's a matter of time, yeah. And Zakaria, in your analyst overview, um, do you have an idea why some of these protests uh, result in the overthrow of the regime and others doesn't? Don't. Sorry. I think you know it's it's important to recognize that Africa has already had two major waves of protests, and both have been very successful. So the first wave of protests, which was the 1940s and 1950s, led to the broader decolonization of the continent. And then if we look at the second wave of protests in the 1980s and the 1990s, it did trigger a broad process of democratization. The challenge now is that what Africans are, are really demanding is, is, is about the meaning of democracy itself. And that's a question for all of us, I think, as humans, not just for Africans. Uh, Africa has, in most cases, uh, regular elections. There are formal institutions. In many cases, you have you know, the trappings of democracy. But what they're asking, and I think what they're demanding, is, is what is this democracy that has been given to us? Right? Uh, and that it must be something more than just elections that are held every four years to bring in a new slate of opposition candidates. Uh, they're, they're raising very fundamental questions about the meaning of democracy. What is democracy? I think, as the video demonstrated, Uh, this idea that democracy has to be something more than, than elections, it has to be something more than a switch in the political party, but must start to address the fundamental needs of the vast majority of the people. And that is a much more challenging question to address, one that all of us, I think, are, are confronting in our own countries. Okay. Um, Chad, your movement uh, contributed to the defeat of uh, President Abdoulaye Wad in Senegal in 2012. Um, and the candidate you preferred at the time was Macky Sall, the current president. But now you say that he has failed to hold his promises, etc. So does it mean that the fight is going on, the fight for more democracy, for better living conditions? Thank you, doctor. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I myself and the movement that I'm part of it, we never thought that Macky Sall was the solution. Because Macky Sall is elected by ex accident. He, he happened to be there and we didn't have no choices. <laughs> so that's why he's the president of Senegal now. And uh, <coughs> we never believed in Macky's program because it's not in the, the Macky's program was just the the program of Abdou Youf, like back in the day. He, he claimed himself the that- The president before Abdoulaye Wade. Yeah, before Abdoulaye Wade. He claimed himself uh, that he's a, someone like a liberal, and uh, we see a social program that he, he proposed. And uh, the movement that I'm part of with Yanamar is involved in somehow, because we, we participate to kick Abdoulaye Wade out of the country. We also received Macky Sall in our headquarter in between the first and the second uh, round during the election in 2011. And then he came to our headquarter and we asked him some several questions about his own program. All those promises that he, he, he said by that time, nothing. He promised that he was going to uh, uh, bring like the, the, the term of the presidential term five years instead of seven, nothing. He promised 50,000 employment for, it, for the youth per year. I, I let you uh, guess. And health care and all of that. No, he's just like one politician, one in the thousand other politicians that we have in Africa, usually. So for us, for, for my movement, instead of stay focusing in Macky Sall, yesterday that was Abdullah Wad, and tomorrow it will be another one, after tomorrow it will be another one, we prefer focus on the population and work with what we call like the new type of Senegalese because we have our own program that we're going to run instead of following the program of politicians because they always lie to us. They will never keep, do, they keep their promises. They will never do what, they, what people expect from him. 
Yes, you will have the question? Yeah, I would really like you to explain the new <laughs> Yes, no problem. <laughs> the new type of Senegalese because I'm not sure that everybody knows what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, in 2011 at the same time that we were protesting in the street against Abdullah Awad candidacy or against Abdullah Awad abuse, uh, we we, sh we said that the solution will come when the population are aware, when the population are involved, when the population criticize themselves and know that there is a system and we are part of the system if we don't do anything. If you accept, if you, if you don't agree, you have to say no. And we decide to do what we call the individual suicide for the collective resurrection. Sacrifice myself for better future for my country. And it means that you, you won't be late like Senegalese used to do, two hours after the, the appointment. Uh, you're not going to pee in the street anymore. You're not going to throw trash in the street anymore. You're not going to accept the corruption, the taxi, the police, and all of that, and some kind of institution like, I need a paper, I have to pay somebody to get it, or something like that. And also, question yourself about what's going on around you. I mean, I'm Senegalese. I'm not yet a new type of Senegalese. I'm working on It's very difficult because I was raised like just regular Senegalese. The ancient type. Let's say that. So, so I'm ch I'm trying also to be the new type of Senegalese that we have the idea the idea of what was going to be like. But we focused on on the on the college, like the, the 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 teenagers, because for us, what we are building is like a tree that we we, we plant. And once you plant a tree, you're not going to see it growing up. You're going to just like put water on. And one day you're going to wake up and see this is the baobab, a big tree. You know, that's what we are doing. But when you cut a tree down, you will hear ka -ka 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 boom. So that's why a uh, lot of media didn't relate it exactly what we are doing, what we were doing this last five years. We have uh, over 300 students that they, we give them fellowship, uh, scholarship. In, uh, in, in a lot of different uh, private universities in Senegal. We did also the program Doh Aksogoh, which means that going to different places in the country, deep side of the country, talking to, to, the, to the elite, like the members of the parliament or the mayor, to discuss r around like what they could do better, what, what the population expect from them. If they are building a road and instead of a hospital, that's what the population needs. But pretty much, Makisal has failed. Makisal, uh, because his program wasn't the good one that we expect. And also, he, the, I feel like I'm not free anymore in my own country because um, uh, he signed a lot of contracts with the multinationals international, basically French multinationals uh, to explore to and, uh, and, and, and steal our resources. And also, Macky Sall and his family, that's the first time in the world I heard a president or some ministers saying, thank you, uh, first lady, because of you I have this job. That's the first time that I heard that. So his wife is the one who hired ministers. So. I, I never heard that in my life. And also, the brother of his wife is, uh, some of the brothers of his wife, because the brother have, the wife has like so many brothers, but they're involved in, the, in, in politics in the country. They are, uh, they are running some programs, they are having some ministers, they are having some program of building the public infrastructure and all of that to just get like the retro commission. So Makisal has failed. That's the reality. And we have to kick him out of the country as we did with Abdullah Awad next election and choose another one. By that time, build the new type of Senegalese and hope that in 2035, this young teenager will have 35 years or 40 years and we can have like the new type of president that we expect from those young teenagers. No. Okay. <laughs> But so if I understand you right, that means even for the next elections, it will, uh, there still will be an accident president because the new type of Senegalese is not yet ready. I think the cream of politicians that we have in Senegal, none of them will, will be the, the serum of our, our, our virus. Mm -hmm. None of them. None of them. I mean, in the opposite, Macky Sall is just somebody who didn't took his courage and say, this is what I want. But what he want to establish in Senegal is like what Senghor, the first president of Senegal, did. Senghor was the one who said, hey, 
In Senegal, I want a unique political party. It's mine. No opposition, nothing. But Macky Sall, he, he can't say that. But well, that's what he's doing. That's what he's planning to do. Because uh, several uh, uh, leaders of the opposition are in jail. He bribed a lot of, uh, I mean, let's say, the, the, the boss of uh, big media, like Yusundu. He's a minister of Macky Sall. And he got like newspapers, TVs, and radios. But he, he's not independent. He works with Macky Sall. And for Macky Sall, for Macky Sall second term also, how is that possible? And also, some other people in the, from the civil society, they work with Macky Sall now. A lot of them, Alintin, uh, Pendambo, uh, Latif Koulibaly, uh, Suleiman Juljob. So human rights those. activists, scientific. Yes, yeah. and mm. they was like with us during the protest against Abdul Awad, and we created what we call the movement of M23. Uh, so now it's, it's dead, that, 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 that movement. I mean, the way that he proposed us also to take some ministers, Maki asked us if we want to be the minister of youth or the minister of culture or working in some embassies out. He wanted to kick us out of the country, so he proposed mm. some posts in embassies outside. <laughs> so, but we refused. But those people, they did not. They accept and they take it, so they shut their mouth now. So, if you don't have opposition, you don't have civil society, you don't have free press, it means that there is no democracy. The play, the game is 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 over. The game is over. So that's what Maki, Maki Sal is trying to do. We, but uh, uh, count on us, we're not going to let that happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I uh, want to make Chad talk <laughs> some longer still. Um, I wanted, uh, I wanted you to explain to the audience the principle of local antennas, because with your Namar, you had local antennas, or you still have them, and I think that might be the key to bring urban protest to rural areas. So please <laughs> explain us. Very important question. I think a uh, lot of movement, they failed because they didn't, they wasn't like, prepared to, to be an organization. They were just like reacting. When you react after, the, after a fact, when that fact doesn't exist anymore, what can you do? Nothing. You sleep. So when, once we created Yanama, the first day, we reflect on how to spread the movement all over the country. And we say, OK, it's open to you guys. Whoever you are, wherever you are, at least you have to be 25 person. And at least in that 25, 10 women. Organize yourself, take the leads, be the, your own leader from your own zone. And then the antenna is the, we call that spirit of Yanamar. Because for us, Yanamar is not like uh, something, it's a state of mind, it's a spirit. If you are fed up of yourself, you are part of Yanamar. I think that everybody here are Yanamars. So, you know, so then. And then uh, those, an those antenna, those representing of the movement, they are free and independent to rule their own program from their own localities. There is some program that the headquarters in Dakar will be in charge. For example, if we launch, we launch uh, by the times like a campaign called Das Fananal, which means register people for the, for, for the vote. And uh, the potential that we could have in Senegal to have to register everybody was 1,200,000. But Yanama registered 700,020 in that, in, the, in, in that file. 700,020 persons registered for the vote. So b for, for that, those kind of campaign is national. So then that's the headquarter who takes it in charge of, of that, that, that kind of program. But I'm going to give you the example of, um, of, uh, of Kafrin, for example. Kafrin is uh, 500 or 400 uh, away from Dakar. It's like a little town, but they have their own spirit. But that spirit, they focus on agriculture because they say that we have a lot of land and we live in a region that we, we can do agriculture of peanuts. So then they organize themselves the way that they, they could do that and they, they ask for some lands and they do that and they, and they work for their own program. The only thing that you can't do when you are a member of Yanamar is politics. You can't be in a political party you can't work for any political uh, leaders. You can't promote any, leadical, uh, any political leaders or activities. And you can't take money to, 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 to uh, let's say, to exchange with 
the activism that you are doing. Uh, that's the only rules. Otherwise, no age, no sex, no religion, no any, all of, the, all of that. Yanamar is open to everybody. So we have, that's why we have spirit all over. And then uh, there is no card, card to be a member. There is no sign to be a member. There is none of those. Because if, if we, we need card to be, to, 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 to be aware of what happened in our country, there is a problem. If you need to sign somewhere to be aware of what happened in your country, there is also a problem. So we open it to everybody if you feel like you are part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Zakaria, you are also dedicating quite some pages on the problem of rural uh, versus um, urban protests. Maybe you can explain to the audience why these, um, why there is such a big gap between rural and urban population. Sure, it's a, it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, it goes back to, of course, the colonial period when ethnicity was used to govern the rural areas in very particular ways. And you had the creation of tribes and chiefs as a way to systematically uh, depoliticize the rural areas, to transform popular energies into ethnic or tribal energies. Uh, the urban spaces were always uh, a de-ethnicized space, a space in which many different ethnic communities came together, uh, largely for labor purposes, but weren't able to be controlled through these traditional structures. Right? And if you look at sort of the trends in Africa over the past couple of decades, Africa is urbanizing at the fastest rate of any continent on the world. So increasingly, the urban spaces are starting to be more and more central politically. And that poses a, a tremendous challenge to many of the incumbent regimes who continue, con continue to rely on ethnic patronage networks based in the rural areas for their power sources. Whereas in the urban areas, you don't have the same sort of ethnic uh, ties that link populations to specific candidates. Now, what is interesting, I think, for, for most of us, and we're all guilty of this, is when we hear the concept of African politics, we automatically assume it's tribal. Right? And when we've seen the, the protests that have emerged in Burundi, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, there's a tendency to dismiss them as essentially tribal politics. Right? The, or, the protests in Ethiopia have been dismissed as Oromo. In Burundi, there was a similar debate about whether this was a Tutsi-Hutu conflict. I think, as, as Tiat has made clear, though, uh, what we are seeing with many of these urban-based political movements is a desire to explicitly reject uh, the tribal model of politics and to try to create movements that are inclusive and bring together people across ethnic, religious, and class lines. Right? Uh, but that's a very strong legacy to overcome because for so long, uh, the base of political power in the, in the African context was, was rural and ethnic based. Even in Burundi, um, you sometimes get the impression that in rural areas there's more support for Pian Kurunziza than in uh, the capital Bujumbura. Do you think some kind of local antennas of a protest movement could help to overthrow the regime? I, about the same structure as in Senegal, Me yes, yes but and for Burundi. Yes and no. Uh, Burundi was different, uh, actually. We had uh, since the, the the Arusha peace uh, agreement, we had we had free press after the civil war. Yeah, after the civil war in the nineties, we had free press, and, uh, and the radios uh, have been like like a big university of human rights for for the whole country. So, so we we had we were like building. Me, I was uh, working like a journalist, mainly in pictures and video. But we had in all the country, every Burundian knows his rights knows about every every policeman every every uh, member of the army knows about human <laughs> rights because we've been talking about it every day since 10 years so the difficulty that that president have got even if there's a gap between the town and the country it was to to break first to burn the radios to shut them down and uh, secondly to try to ethnicize that's why he created his militia when you see pictures, where, where, when he goes somewhere and you see uh, there's thousands of people, those people are obliged to go. You, you have group of militians everywhere. There, there's so many reports that are talking about them, that people are fleeing the country not because there's a problem in Bujumbura, in the capital. They're fleeing the country because there's a local problem. You, you have this uh, delocalization of despotism. So the violence, the terrorism of the, the power goes from the top and goes up to the, the last hill in the country. Otherwise, you couldn't explain that most of the refugees are Hutus, actually. Ma the majority is rural people, because the, the 500,000 people are not from town. We can say uh, less than half of them. So the question is, there's a gap in the understanding. In town, uh, people listen to music. People, uh, there's new cultures in town. But people of country knows them rights. 
they know the, the, the expectation from the government that they know them because they, they had we had free pre pre press and uh, they've been speaking on radio listening to radio every day so uh, now uh, it will be the same that, that those powers those new powers will try to ethnicize or to, to travelize the conflicts but it's too late it's too late the people knows what they want it's, it's a question it's a matter of time so, but if I wanted to be mean, I would say the government has had the right strategy, the strategy of local antennas of militia in order to suppress. No, it's a suicide. It's a suicide for itself. Uh, Why? Uh, because we had the same, the same story in Rwanda in the 90s, and we know how it ended up. So uh, they can use this despotism, local despotism, for a short while, but people are silent. And, uh, you, you know, 10 guys, 10 guys can burn 10 hills. Ten guys armed can burn ten hills. When you want to kill uh, a thousand people, you don't need an army. It can be done by by hand by ten guys who are armed, because the people is uh, the, the, the 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 population cannot even defend themselves, or they are supported by the army. But at the end of the day, those ten guys dies, or they 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 they, they get crushed and they get judged. But it's a suicide for the government. It can it can't uh, stay like that. Okay. Linda, how does your movement reach the rural population? This morning you told us about social media and the role of social media. Do you get the rural people with Facebook or Twitter? Um, in Zimbabwe, the situation is a bit complex because um, most of uh, the people in the rural areas are disempowered. Most of them don't work and most of them don't have phones. But... Um, Thanks to the Chinese who brought their cheap phones, they're now the boys who had cows and the teachers there who are on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the most effective uh, tool of communication in Zimbabwe. It gets the message across on time. And we also have Voice of America, uh, Studio 7, that radio station that is broadcasted from um, Washington, D.C., um, most of the people in the rural areas listen to it. And we also have a social movement called Zimbabwe Adzoka, which is mainly operating in the rural areas and trying to interact with them as they do their day-to-day -day chores. Like, for example, they've got something they call Nimbe, where people in a certain community meet and go to someone's farm and help cultivate that farm, and the following day they're at a different farm. So they have been trying to also use the same channel that they go and grace those Nimbes where they are cultivating to together at the same time sharing information. So you'll find that in Zimbabwe we've got about four different protest movements, but what we have done this year is we have, we have managed to merge and to work together at the same time oh, uh, ensuring that we maintain our different constituencies which we have been uh, getting to in different ways. You'll find that we've got Zimbabwe Adzoka for the rural populace, we've got Tajamuka, the radical youth element, which I am part of, we've got this flag movement, uh, which is mainly for the um, middle class and the churchy people and then we also have uh, the Zimbabwean citizens movement which is mainly dealing with um, empowering people and I'm also part of the Zimbabwe citizens movement where we are saying um, Zimbabwean citizens need to get out of their fake comfort zone they need to be proactive in governance issues and that we have to work together to create the Zimbabwe that we want and to bring back power to the people so that they'll be able to stand up and demand what is right. You see them for a very long time we've got a populace that is very politically literate that wants to separate itself from the politics of the land and civil matters. That is why Zimbabwe is in the situation that it is in right now so we've been using the platform of uh, Zimbabwe Citizens Movement to ensure that we move and we also try and change the mindsets of Zimbabwean citizens to end the water apathy and all that and to get everyone involved because we believe that no one can fight for a better Zimbabwe more than a Zimbabwean and we have to do it together and we have to share that information and um, new ideas and a new way of doing things in a new Zimbabwe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so So if I get you right, you're all also trying to create the new type of Zimbabwean. Um, that, that takes me to the question, what is going wrong in, in Africa? Because before Chad said that um, even for elections, there are no real candidates because you get the impression that everyone is corrupt, etc. Uh, what do you do to empower Zimbabweans and to, to create this new type of Zimbabwean? First of all, we are preaching the message of a zero-tolerance stance on corruption. 
corruption is a cancer that has destroyed Africa, not only Zimbabwe as a whole. So we're trying to cultivate that, um, that zero tolerance stance to corruption, zero tolerance to violence, because so long I am involved in corrupt activities, I cannot go and preach to the next person to stop the corrupt activities. And I cannot go and ask a corrupt leader to stop being corrupt. But change, I believe that change starts with you and me. We have to, to be the change that we've been waiting for because no one is going to come and be that change when you have not changed. And this is the message that we like preach on a daily basis that change starts with you. You have to change first and then demand change from the next person and demand change from the leaders. And gradually I see ourselves getting there because we, we I've always been saying to my fellow Zimbabweans we actually risk ushering in a worse off dictatorship than the Robert Mugabe regime if we do not start even bringing the opposition leaders to account so as long as we cannot make the opposition leaders um, uh, account themselves and be transparent, there's nothing that we'll be doing and we'll actually reverse the gains of the struggle that we're fighting for. So we have to move with the change issue first. It's a process, it's not going to happen overnight, but it has to start somewhere and we have already started that. We are pushing for change, change of ideology, change of your mindset and change of character and attitude will actually usher in the Zimbabwe that we dream of. Okay. <laughs> I, I would like to know, um, maybe from Zakaria, I get the impression that uh, very often protests, um, for protests you need a charismatic figure. That was so in the colonial period. There was Kwame Nkrumah, Sankara, Lumumba, etc. Now you have uh, rappers like Chad or strong women like Linda. Um, in um, Burkina Faso, it was uh, Ballet Citoyen. Do you really need this kind of charismatic figure, or can protests be successful without? I think it's important to understand the, the failures of the charismatic leader model. Right, I mean, we've had many charismatic leaders in Africa, uh, no shortage. Um, but oftentimes what happens is when you put all your faith in a, a singular person, uh, they then tend to reinforce that singularity once they come to power. Right? We saw this with very many inspirational figures like Kwame Nkrumah, who was the sort of key theorist of, of nonviolent resistance in the African context. But once he came to power, he sort of systematically went about demobilizing the same constituencies that brought him to power in the first place. Right? And I think Consistently, what we've seen with the sort of younger generation of activists is a skepticism of, of the charismatic leader model, right? a sense that any movement that is really going to bring about a transformative change in the African context cannot invest all of its hope uh, and faith in a singular persona. Right? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a time of experimentation. I don't know, I don't know if the activists can tell us if, if this model is going to work, but increasingly what we see is you know, an emphasis on a decentralized model of organizing, a sense that there shouldn't be a singular person who's at the forefront, but rather that many people should be empowered to be at the forefront of any movement. Uh, we've seen a, a tendency to insist on autonomy, that the movements cannot be tied to political parties, they cannot be tied to foreign donors, they cannot be tied to other sorts of political agendas that exist, but must actually reflect the will and interests of the people. Uh, and so I think these are innovations in terms of how African protest is pushing the broader concept of nonviolent resistance itself forward. I don't think we are at a point yet to say whether it's going to be successful, but we certainly need new models. And I think I find a lot of inspiration in, in the ways in which young people across Africa are, are, are starting to experiment uh, with new ways of organizing and, and resisting uh, that are very conscientious of the, the pitfalls present in the earlier models of resistance. It's true that there were many uh, charismatic figures from the colonial period who, who turned uh, different afterwards, like Kwame Nkrumah, as you said, even Robert Mugabe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But by, by the way, um, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, uh, Linda, you wrote an open letter to Robert Mugabe after having been uh, beaten up after some protests. Um, maybe you can tell the audience a bit more about your open letter, and I would like to know if you ever got an answer. <laughs> um, obviously, I didn't get an answer. He would never respond. In February this year, we had a protest which started on the 1st of February, um, which was called Hashtag 21 Days of Activism, where we came up with 21 critical issues that were supposed to be resolved by President Robert Mugabe and his ANU-PF cabal not government, because um, 
he uses more than two million US dollars every year on his birthday, a lavish birthday celebration. Yet we've got hospitals with no medication. The roads now have craters, not potholes, and um, the education sector is in doldrums. There's there's a cash crisis in Zimbabwe. You can't even get ten dollars out of the bank. That's how bad things are. But he can afford to have a lavish birthday party. He goes to Singapore every week to get his treatments. His daughter gave birth in Dubai and all that. So we were actually saying. What is the point of having a lavish birthday party uh, during the 21 days? Because his birthday is on the 21st of February. So he celebrated his birthday on the 25th of February. And on that very same day, coincidentally, doctors were in strike in Zimbabwe because they earned less than 700 US dollars. And uh, they were actually demanding a better working conditions, with hospitals with medication, so that they could also uh, work properly in the hospitals. So we decided to go and protest uh, against the birthday at Parinyato Hospital, which is the major referral hospital in Arare. And we only went and sat at the hospital, and I was brutally attacked by the police. They said I wanted to expose the president. I was actually arrested the very same day. And we had to pay a fine under duress because I was in bad shape. They didn't want to get me to the doctors. And after I paid that fine, I was um, admitted at Avenue's clinic. I was put on oxygen. That was how bad I'd been beaten up by the police. So um, I wrote that letter when I was in hospital. I was in pain. I just couldn't believe that. I mean, they could be so brutal, yet I had... Uh, a, a, a human worthy cause that I was fighting for. People are dying in their thousands every day in the hospitals but no one speaks about it, no one writes about it. What is important is just upping the Mugabe regime which is oppressing people and um, inflicting gross of violations of human rights and the response I got from the government was brutality and it just didn't make sense. And I wrote a letter to the president demanding to know if we were all supposed to die in Zimbabwe so that we could save his life, which is um, towards the end, because I don't even think that he's got more than two years to live. Mm. You're talking about a miserable state of uh, hospitals, of uh, roads, um, etc. cetera. Do, do, do you sometimes think that uh, the international community doesn't do enough to stop this kind of situation because they still continue cooperation with your country? As it is the, the case for many other countries in Africa. Yes, I believe that it's not doing enough. And I, I actually don't believe that the ZANU-PF government should actually be getting any funding because most of the funds that they receive, they buy police cars, they buy water cannons, and it is used to oppress activists and people who want change. So, the, um, for example, uh, for his birthday party, ZANU-PF actually went and took fuel from the hospital and ambulances had no fuel. And they actually had to have a wrangle for the whole month of March we, when the hospitals were now demanding their fuel back. That is how bad and severe the situation is. And because the media is compromised, these things don't come out in the media. So at the end of the day, I really believe that um, Mugabe believes that He can deal with his country his own way. So the international community should actually stop funding the ZANU-PF government so that he will deal with Zimbabwe the way that he always says he can deal with his country the, his own way. And we'll also see where he's going to get that money to go and get treated in Singapore. Because that money is not there. It is the money that he diverts from the funds that they receive as a government for service delivery in the country, but he uses it for his own personal use with his family. And why, maybe chat because you're nodding, why is there no outcry in even here in the, in the Western countries when they hear that uh, Zimbabwe president is going to hospital in Singapore with their money? Uh, I mean, he's, he's not the, the only one. I mean, uh, <laughs> it Mugabe, doesn't make it better. Yeah, Ma Mugabe is not the only one. Abdullah Iwad also used to, to, to come to Paris go to Paris also for, for, for that. And that's the that's the image that you can understand because they are old and they they know that the system of health care that they establish in our own country is not good. That's simple as like like that. Their kids are sent to Europe or US to study. It means that they know that the system of education is not good. That's the response of all of that. Yes, of course, some media 
you you uh, you mentioned earlier uh, the role of some media or the role of the su government support why they support they still support those dictators mm -hmm. i think they like those dictators many of the leaders of the west like those dictators because those dictators help them to keep exploding uh, uh, to taking our resources because if mugabe is not longer in zimbabwe the new one will might not accept people taking their resources and bring it to europe they need to have the insurance they need to have the they need to to, to know that the next one who will come will accept the, to cut deals with them and they can they can move the new uh, the short the example that i'm going to give you is when we were doing the protest against abdullah Iwad, we never had any support from outside they observe to see the moves once they know that abdullah Iwad gonna fail and then they start supporting us because they know that something is gonna come something is going on french militaries was at fight like there was like this to come out and support karim Wad. That was the military of Senegal who say, no, we're not going to let French militaries come in here like I, what they did in Ivory Coast and, 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 and created the civil war in Ivory Coast. Mm. And the world know about that. The West also know about the currency that we use in Senegal in, 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 in 14 countries sharing the same currency called Franc CFA, Colonie Francaise de l'Afrique, after 60 years of independence. France is in EU. Nobody in EU pointed out, either Germans or either, none of to say, hey, France, you should stop doing this. Everybody know about the France Afrique, how they do it. They know that there is a specific office in the Elysee in Paris who handle African businesses with the big companies like Total, like Elf, like Shell, like Ocean, like Leader Price, like all those big companies. The world know about it. But the world won't say won't do anything because that's not their business. Africa, you can die there. That's not a problem. We don't need you. We need your resources. That's what it is. In the the role of <laughs> thank you. And I I think I think the role of the media in in here is so important to let these people know because I know that if these people know what's going on in Africa they might gonna protest more than we protest in Africa because they don't want to have, uh, how many people have right, uh, here iPhone here? I don't know, but maybe the most of it. But if they knew that the call time is the most important thing in the iPhone, it is coming from Republic Democratic Congo, big up for my brother uh, uh, Fred from Lucha. And they are kids seven years old with Kalashnikov coming from Russia, from China, from Israel from United States, from France, from maybe Germany, I don't know, I'm not sure, otherwise I would have tell you. And then they kill each other to protect the mine for big companies who explore the Colton to create it iPhone or Macintosh. Everybody is happy to get his iPhone and nobody question how I get this iPhone. Mm. Nobody questioned. Nobody asked the question how I get it. Uh, France, France is one of the first country who, who in, in terms of exportation of uranium without having uranium in their own, own ground. France, the first country who give uranium to the world without having uranium in French land. No, 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 no that's not, I mean, it's the question that people have to ask. What kind of resources do you have, for example, in Germany? Where the energy to have lights come from? Where the iron that you use come from? Where those resources making you building some roads and towers and stuff like that come from? You know that you don't have that in your land, on the underground. You don't know that, you don't have that. So questions, how your politicians cut deals with other politicians. So they want those dictators on the power to keep doing what they are doing. That's, that's the only reason. Mm. Uh, Teddy wants to say something uh, on the same subject. <laughs> That there's a good connection to, to, to do with news. What he's saying is that our role is not only to protest against our president. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, maybe me, I decided I'm a refugee now, but I live in Rwanda next door, next to my country. Uh, we, we are, maybe we are leaders, we are activists, uh, but we symbolize something for the youth. Me, I have, we have 500,000 people 
in exile and all the young kids wants to come to Europe, wants to become migrants, wants to come in your countries, wants to, wants to end up in the Mediterranean uh, eaten by fishes. They prefer that. But the game we are playing, the role we are playing today is to keep a kind of minimum of hope, even if we die, you know. He talked about suicide, uh, but w I think that the, the question of charisma is not, uh, the, question, the, the question is the, the suicide. The, all these people decided to die for, 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 for their country, in a way. It's a kind of personal suicide for the better of the others. If you do connection with, with the news, we are the, the last barrier of hope to, to keep those young guys there, tell them we can change it and we will live better. That's what I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. It's yours. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe at this point we can come to the point of networking, because um, in a way, African activists have the same objectives, for example, to overcome uh, phenomena like France Afrique uh, or for Ethiopia, for example, that the United States are still supporting the regime. Um, what do you think about this pan African networking, Linda? <laughs> um, I think the pan African networking is very critical for our struggle in Africa because um, the problems that we face in the different African countries is the same. And we have to get to a stage where we're working together, cross-pollinating ideas on how we can transform Africa. Like I said earlier on uh, today when I was talking about how rich Africa is in resources, but we have got no processing units, we've got no manufacturing plants. I always give the example of um, Switzerland. It has uh, the best manufacturers of chocolate, but they don't even grow cocoa. It is grown in Western Africa. And in Western Africa, they've got nowhere where they process the cocoa. You find in Zimbabwe, we've got diamonds, we've got a lot of minerals, but um, diamonds are actually taken to India for polishing, of which those are actually units that could make our economy grow if we had our own polishing uh, industries and everything like that. But that is where we lack in Africa. We've got the resources, but we don't have a means of... Um, processing those resources for us to get um, economically viable and to be able to stand on our own two feet. So it is critical for young people, especially young people in Africa, to start um, this thought leadership process on how we can transform our, situ our situation for us to be sustainable independently without the interventions of the worst so that we can actually process our resources and sell the end product for the benefit of Africa so that we can take Africa to the first country status, which we should have gotten there a long time ago. But because uh, most of our revolutionary leaders were selfish, were greedy, were corrupt, they didn't care about um, the economic transformations after attaining liberation from the colonialists. All they were interested in was perfecting the, um, the oppression that happened during the colonial era. And now it is our mandate uh, as young African leaders to be able to converge and make way forward for Africa as a continent. I know I, I know Chad that for example Yon Amar has been trying to network um, uh, some time ago. Some of your activists uh, have gone to <laughs> to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and have been arrested there because the Congolese regime uh, was afraid of this networking, which proves that it is important. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about this. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, in st at the same time that we're talking about new type of Senegalese, we think about new type of African also, which is very important, and new type of <coughs> citizen of the world. Why, why not? And uh, sometimes we, we go to... A African, another African country because they invite us. Fred here from Republic Democratic of Congo is a member of a movement called Lucha and uh, another movement called Filimbi in, uh, in, uh, in Republic Democratic Congo invite, invite uh, the movement to go there and you know, exchange strategies and have a panel discussion and all of that. And then they were arrested there. And also myself, I was kicked out of Equator Guinea. The same time that uh, I'm Persona no grata in a lot of African countries, Guinea-Bissau, Gambia, now, yeah, Jame is gone, it's okay. Uh, Mauritania, and all of those countries, and uh, also Angola. So, so which means that they know. 
they know what's going to happen. They know that when, when a nonviolent movement is happening somewhere, how can we respond? How can our politicians then respond to a nonviolent uh, protest? That's the problem. Because the only thing that they could do is to protect the protest, but not. They shoot on population, and the world will know about what they are doing, their, their crimes and attack. Because they're not smart, those people. They, they respond with, with repression. They respond with arresting people. They respond with, with beating people or creating like um, a chaos in the country and put the military out the street, That's, which is not definitely a solution. So this network ended up, have, we, we ended up with the, uh, the idea of organizing the university of citizens in, in Dakar in, uh, very soon, the end of the year. And uh, we want to bring out, uh, in, uh, we want to bring there in Senegal the whole activities that we know already. And if somebody knows some other activists, we're going to try to to bring them there in in Senegal. It's going to be difficult, I know, because we don't have like uh, the right funding to to do that. And sometimes, if for example uh, a foundation want to help us about like the the airplane f ticket, somebody will say, oh. There is Germans behind them. Oh, there is you know, USID behind them. That's, then the US is involved and stuff like that. And I can't understand. We have so many billionaires only in Nigeria who could help the whole African social movement to grow and move forward. But that's not their interest. They, they prefer buying jet, private jet or uh, having their, their, their uh, club in Saint Champs Elysees in Paris. That's, that's, that's something makes us like really frustrated. Who gonna help us to move forward? We can't have like the income that we need to, to organize ourselves in the way that we wanna meet somewhere. Imagine that the first time that I met Fred is here because of you. I know him, we talk, we, uh, we are connected online in a virtual way. But the first time that I shake his hand, it was here yesterday, uh, here in Germany. That's ironic, that's ironic. And but that's it's also super. It's a chance. Yes. Yeah. That's also super because you because of you. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just crazy. And also the word pan-Africanism, I don't like it because it's a very old word. And, uh, and maybe inter-African. Exactly, but maybe an African name. We need to African mate. African name, name. Okay. We need to choose something in Zulu or in Swahili to define our network. We don't need a French word or an English word, no. That we failed first. If we choose a name from another language from another country, we failed, the first thing. The name has to be an African languages first. And then uh, what the Pan-Africanism theory from Krumah and all of that people, it, that, that's not the same situation anymore. We can't have Pan-Africanism with uh, having one president for Africa, the Union, uh, or, and all the rest are governor in their own country. Mugabe will never let Dos Santos be the president of Africa. <laughs> but I don't have problem to have Linda as a president <laughs> of the population. You know. so, so pretty much, pretty much it means that not from the top to the bottom, but from the bottom to the top. That's how we're gonna change things from the bottom to the top. And also develop our own languages, our own currency, create our own computers, and demand the rest of the world to exchange with Africa with our own languages and our own currency with the rate that we gonna decide is gonna be. Not for, from with the euro or the dollar that belongs to somebody else that uh, if you have like one CFA, it means that you need uh, one dollar, it means 600 CFA. That the exchange is not equal. So we're gonna choose our own currency and put our own rate that the world will follow. Africa is late because we're still running behind the train of the rest of the world. We have to crane our own locomotive and choose our own way and the world will join us. That's the solution. I like the idea of uh, creating a movement right now here in Germany, maybe between uh, the activists who are here, and then create local antennas of this movement in your different countries. 
yeah 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 so so maybe maybe this is the right moment to open the discussion to the audience um i don't know if someone is quick and already has his question in mind otherwise i can give you one or two minutes and we continue the discussion oh there's one very <coughs> quick uh, quick lady <laughs> Um, maybe we need a microphone. Ah, okay, it's coming. Thank you. You can you can uh, ask your questions in German too, as we have um, translation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine with English. Uh, so, my name is Anna Fichtmüller, and I'm writing my PhD on Uganda, and briefly touch the question of social movements as well. And uh, one of the questions I have is something that has been recurrent in the Arab Spring, and also in some of those movements, was the question of the role of the middle class. And uh, so, what I would like to ask you is then, who are the people in the movements? Who is the one who's driving them? Is this like a middle class, or is it like the urban poor, as I think you called it in your book? Um, and if so, then my question would also be, what are you like? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then another question, which I, you touched it already briefly, but I think it, it's worth going more into, is the question of the rural-urban divide. And um, there was uh, Christian Thibon, he's a French, um, researcher, he recently said that he believes that many of the actually uh, movements, they failed because in the, they lack the support of rural urban, rural, sorry, rural areas. And um, I think it's a very strong statement to make. So is it true that like all of your presidents or in other African countries, aren't they like having a strong local rural base? I know For Uganda, I think it's partly true because Museveni has a lot of uh, credits given to him for ending a civil war and so on. So yes, I wonder if this can be generalized more. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. If there are already other questions, we can maybe collect two or three. Okay, this gentleman. <laughs> ah, okay, there's a lady too. Oh, okay, just <laughs> go ahead and afterwards the gentleman. Okay. Uh, Hi, I'm Nora. I'm working at um, in Kota Network, which is a yeah, campaigning NGO, um, also on resources. And I would be interested in, um, you kind of touched on the um, basically also role of us in um, consuming iPhones, etc. So what, how do you see yeah, the role of German citizens, um, development organizations, NGOs? Do you think it's actually our main task to just educate the people here uh, about the relationships um, between Africa and Europe? and um, Or do you see a point in also development projects like uh, value chain uh, upgrading projects, as you touched on, that kind of try to um, educate, um, for example, African farmers on how to process their cashew nuts? Um, yeah, or do you act, would you actually also go as far as saying uh, development aid actually needs to be cut down in or order to uh, force African leaders to do something? Um, yes, that's my question. Thank you. And the last question for this time. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. It was really amazing and really interesting. And I, I would... Um, Yeah, I think like this is a question I would like to uh, talk about as well. Like I don't know, people seem to be quite aware the problem is one that's no not exclusively African, but it has to do with like um, Western corporations and Western consumers and like people. I mean, like I don't know, as you could see from the applause, like people seem to be quite aware of that. And I think so. Like what we need is not only a Pan-African thing, but like a universal thing. I mean, like, I think people in Europe and the US and every and in Africa and Asia like need to join hands and say all right like we have a struggle like we have a struggle in common um i think like this is something i mean that we should talk about because i mean it's, i i'm like i see it as a structural problem i think like it's capitalism essentially and leaders are like corrupt otherwise they wouldn't be leaders and yeah this is maybe a problem that we should address 
Okay, thank you. So who of you feels the most concerned um, about the question of middle class, the role of middle class? You? <laughs> okay, go ahead, Linda. Um, the middle class uh, pulled a shocker in Zimbabwe last year. No one expected the middle class to come out and start speaking out openly about our oppression in Zimbabwe and protesting in a way. And we've actually realized that um, the middle class has now come out of its shell. And uh, like my sister here asked a question, who are you and at which level are you? I think I belong to the poor Ebonites. That is where I belong. And we have been working very well with the middle class in Zimbabwe. And they've been really cooperative, um, especially with ideas and some with resources. Because it's not every middle class person who is prepared to go into the streets. But we've been liking the way they've been collaborating with us and complementing our efforts. And some of them are now even open enough to come up in the open and speak out against the regime, which has been a very positive move. And, Uh, protest movements in Zimbabwe and um, the role of um, the rural um, uh, protest movements is still growing. Um, I think it is also imperative to understand that um, ZANU-PF stronghold is in the rural areas. They, they um, naturally take advantage of their desperateness because no one in the rural areas in Zimbabwe owns land. Even after the land reform, those who were actually allocated land were only given offer letters. So those people will naturally keep voting for ZANU-PF so that they'll be able to maintain their land, not because they like ZANU-PF. It is actually a tool that ZANU-PF has used to ensure that people keep voting for them. There is no one in the rural areas who's got a title deed for the land that they occupy in the rural areas. And the situation is made worse by the fact that the chiefs that were put in place who are very partisan and uh, are under the ZANU-PF ticket will make sure that they harass and intimidate the rural people in the rural areas. So it is actually an ongoing process where we are trying to conscientize the rural electorate that they should play a part because they are the ones who tend to benefit more if we succeed in, um, in turning around the government of Zimbabwe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Teddy? I just wanted to answer the question of middle class. It's no matter of, of being middle class or not. The question is political education and political uh, consciousness and culture générale, as we say in French. You can find people in middle class who are fools, who doesn't understand about what, what is going on. Uh, and, and on the other side, you can, you can live with some people who comes from nowhere, but who have got political education and, and who wants to change the things. And uh, besides it, there's a matter of courage and how, how, how many risks you want to take. So in, in this kind of movements, you find people, uh, I think it's, you find people from, from very different uh, um, uh, niveau de vie, I don't know how, how to say it. Living Thank you. So, so the, question, the question is not about uh, the where you come from, it's what you, you have in mind and uh, how, how many risks do you want to take here? Yeah. Chat, maybe you want to answer on the rural-urban divide? Maybe this, this was the reason why you created these local antennas, because rural people have different problems. I mean, uh, it's come to, it's very connected, those questions, I think, uh, talking about classes and the role of rural areas and also how it could be global, the fight, not just Africans or Europeans themselves. <coughs> those questions are connected. I mean. There is the system who, 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 who put in our mind that this is the high class, this is the low, this is the middle, this is the... I think the highest class who could exist on earth is the class of people who are aware and engaged and committed uh, to, to do for, their, for the rest of the, the, the world. That's the first class for me. And uh, those people who claim themselves that they are the oh, middle or high class because they are they have more wealth and more educated in the way that they go, they study more. It's not, those people are just like the, I mean, for me, they, they, they doesn't mean anything in terms of like uh, what we need, what we do need today to change the world. Example that I can give you is Yanamar. I am rapper. Uh, some members are journalists, some members are lawyers, 
some are, are doctor, some other are just regular worker in the street. Some even they don't have a, a job. They just clean cars when, when the car stops at the red light. They don't even have a job. But when we you come to the meeting of Yanamar, it's like who is who? We just equal discussing. Because we all have like something that we wanna we wanna share or something that we wanna defend or something that we wanna change in the way of our our our, our own life. And then the representing of the movement, that's why it's very, 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 very rich. Because I am in Dakar, but I can know what's happened in the deep side of the country because of those people who are there. They, 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 they bring the information in Dakar to the headquarters that I can know what's going on down there. So it's very, 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 very important to work with the, all every kind of classes. I don't like the word, but every kind of people could be part of a movement like that and have to be part of a movement like that. And how we can make those, this problem global? It is global already. Because when President Af African presidents are failed, when they failed, when the system is not good in Africa, you have how many refugees in, in Germany? How many illegal situation person? I don't like the word because I'm a human being. I, I, the earth belongs to me. Unless I go to Mars, we can talk about illegal or immigration. <laughs> but Earth belongs to human beings. So, but what I can do, there is already a system who put the borders and barriers and passport. This passport is better than this one. With this one, you can go all over you want. With this one, you can't, and this and that. So the problem is global because you have like immigrants. You have refugees, you have clandestine immigrants. So then, if nobody take care of Africa, some Africans will leave Africa and bring the same problem here to you. And we might end up you going to Africa illegally. <laughs> because they will bring the problem of Africa here, you will not gonna breathe. That's a global problem. If the politician, how can, today I was, uh, I was reading like the news in Senegal, like is is already in the cycle of Yanamar we are discussing. There is a deal in between Maki and Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel, Merkel, and we call that the deal Maki Merkel. <laughs> the deal is Maki bring a program to Angela Merkel and say, this is the program for me to run Senegal, and for this program I need this amount of money. How could you help me? Because in this program, I'm going to do this in healthcare, I'm going to do this and that and that, and I'm going to bring every year 5,000 jobs to, to kids or to students who just uh, come from the university. And Merkel say, oh, yes, that's a nice idea. So then I can send back the illegal situations here. Maki say, yes, of course, bring them back. Just give me the money, I'm going to give them a job. And now the Senegal is here without paper. They are receiving a letter asking them to go to a place, I forget the name, I send it to some of you, I don't know where is the area, in Munchen somewhere, and the airport is next by there. Once they get there, they will send them back to Senegal. And once they get to Senegal, because some few are already in Senegal, once they get to Senegal, Maki will give them 10,000 and a sandwich and a Coke at the airport to go to their home. <laughs> 10,000 CFA is uh, 16 euro, 16 euro. So then the problem is global. We need to fix this as soon as possible. Yeah. Because it's, it's connected, I think. You can answer to the question about uh, your expectations of uh, German citizens and um, the idea of cutting maybe development aid because it touches yeah. the same subject. Yeah, yeah. I think like... Uh, the, the connection, the help of German, I mean, for example, I'm gonna give you a few examples that I faced. There is one country who success in planting seed on, a, on the top of a mountain. Nobody could expect that plant or, uh, I don't know the word in English, ble, le ble. Um, wheat. Wheat could grow on a mountain. That country called Israel. So they're good in agriculture. 
they so good in agriculture. They have the technique in terms of agriculture. But Israel don't do cooperation in agriculture. If you ask for, uh, for help about agriculture, they will say no. But if you ask for weapon, yes, of course, they will give you lot, as much as you want in terms of uh, weapons. So the system also here that you developed to grow your agriculture, why the government of Senegal can't benefit to that program of agriculture? Because that's not their interest. That's a problem. If there is engineer or somebody who know, who studied all this kind of stuff, let's, fit, let's see a platform. This foundation could be the platform of joining us together in a program called that, OK, I'm a lawyer. I'm going to give you some advices because you are activist in your own country. You're risking your life. Just call this number on time. We can see what we can do from, from Germany to help you or to support you. Oh, no, I am, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a student, and I'm following the program of human rights. This is your, your right compared to your constitution. That's what you can do. And giving us advices in those kind of things. Because in Europe, they developed so many activities, so many things in terms of like um, technology to, to grow uh, uh, some, some, some plants somewhere in a difficult, in a, dif in a rock, on a rock, and all those kind of stuff. We, we, you might help us in those kind of way. It's very useful, I think, to, to, to have those kind of support. And then uh, also to be more close to the population, not to the mainstream media, because they lie too much. They talk about disease. They talk about uh, suffering, killing each other. You can come to Dakar or to Arare and walk freely. There is no problem. No monkey or donkey or lion come to get you. <laughs> None of those. Because people don't have the right information. That's true. We have a joke like that in Senegal. Someone asked to the guy, hey, I heard that you live on a tree in Africa. He said, yes. Your embassy, by the way, is the tree next to mine. <laughs> and he said, what? The ambassador of my country from in your country is on the tree, the mind say, hey, ask yourself question before you ask those kind of stupid <laughs> questions. You know what I mean? So pretty much, you can play the role of a media. Let know people who couldn't make it today what's happened in Africa to help the world changing. Let, let know the, the world. Let know the world. That's your responsibility. We are there on the field, but you here, you also have a responsibility because you know now about Zimbabwe. You know now about Chad or Libya or Congo or Senegal or Rwanda or Tanzania or Burundi. You know now. Mm. Your responsibility is, responsibility is to let the rest of the world know. Yes. So I think you have at the same time answered to the question about universal movements, yeah. but Teddy wanted to actually, react on... Actually, yeah. the, the story of the tree, I had it and I, and I said it, and the guy, <laughs> some guys believed me, they were like, the tree number 33, my tree was number 33. Now, I just wanted <laughs> to say, I just wanted to say, um, cooperation NGOs uh, of uh, Germany, it's, it's, uh, it comes from the image that Africa gives you, or that you have given yourself of Africa. Uh, I hope that for us being here, refusing to c come and become migrants or staying here because we can maybe live better than l being in those problems, is an example for you to show you that we know what we want. We know what we want. We, we know the Africa we want. So what should do cooperation today is to ask African people what they want, or to help them in a way to, to set up, to give a chance uh, to, to their, their dreams to come through. And stop, stop giving, uh, the, the only image of Africa is not those migrants coming. It's not kids, kids on the streets or starving or whatever. Yes, sometimes it's true. But some of the time, you have to know that there's millions and millions of young Africans who want to stay and build Africa, who refuses to come and stay here or to come to get social aid or become a the Citoyen de Second Zone. So what should be done is is to set up a kind of reflection about what are you going to do. Sometimes cooperation comes. You have a hospital here made by the French, and you have another one next to it made by the Germans, and the Belgian comes do another one because there's a nice, the road is go, is okay because the population here have understood uh, and uh, it, can be, it can be something they can show that they have done. While in, uh, in all other places in the country, there's nothing. 
So it's about to know what we need and how to do it. Sometimes they spend your money doing things that we don't need, that we have already achieved. Or they bring us shoes, why, why we don't need shoes? We, we can make shoes in our countries. We need some, we, we need some other sh uh, stuff. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if there are further questions, otherwise I would... Hmm? Ah, okay, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello? You can hear me. Okay, I'm Haile Mangesha from Ethiopia. I was a pri private businessman in Ethiopia and nowadays I'm living in Berlin. Uh, left my country because of the situation. Uh, so, um, this program is really very good, uh, being prepared by Deutsche Welle and uh, HBS, uh, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, for organizing this kind of uh, podium discussion, having those um, activists and uh, <coughs> freedom fighters here, or authors like the Karyas. So uh, I think <coughs> we could learn a lot, even uh, inter-African information. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed because Ethiopia the magnitude was too big. When I see all those pictures, what happened in your countries and compare it to Ethiopia, it is unbelievable big what in Ethiopia happened. The whole population was against, when it was revolting. And the whole people, it is a big, the biggest population after Nigeria, as you know, Ethiopia. So it has been crushed by the, by the military, by, by this government who's been supported, as you have mentioned, by the worst allies, unfortunately. So I think we are coming to the common understanding that unless these ent development activities, unless this so-called entwicklung silfe politik doesn't change, I think we don't have this opportunity to change in our countries because it is a global world. And I think what I hope is that another organization, another podium discussion should be maybe prepared. It could be a proposal from my side. Having involved those activists and German and Wiglundsieber politic makers. And then discuss, as, in, as they mentioned, we tell you what we need. That's why we're here. Don't do what you need strategically, you know? It should be open for both sides and one should talk the real problem, and the real problem is that these dictators have been supported by these uh, allies under the so-called Realpolitik, what we hear it in Germany, but that is not the solution. When we see those dictators getting money for oppressing the people by returning the refugees back, you know, making a, a contract with these dictators is disaster. We cannot talk to the people in Africa why those politicians are really, after oppressing, killing all these people, being, being also rewarded. You know, this is unbelievable. So this is a story where we should discuss and ask for a change in the entwicklungs politics. Then I hope something could change. And I don't know whether you have mentioned in your book, I'm now interested to read your book. I have not read yet. Where, where, where you have maybe mentioned the solution, the role of uh, Western partners, the role of World Bank, you know, uh, whether you have mentioned it. This is what I want to uh, say at the comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Zakaria could react to this. The, you know, the, there's a theme running through this conversation and that is, I think, a, a natural anxiety that most of us who come from the West often have in regards to African movements in particular. And, and that is because many of us recognize uh, that there is a sort of perverse strain of Western saviorism that often comes when it, com when it comes to how we deal with African politics, right? Uh, and I think that we need to sort of recognize that the trends that are unfolding in many African countries are also unfolding in the West, they're also unfolding in Asia. And so I think, you know, the gentleman in the back was, was quite right that this is a, a, a global circumstances, right? Uh, we all know that inequality globally has risen dramatically. Uh, we know that uh, a smaller and smaller set of, of people have greater and greater share of the, global, of, of the world's resources. Uh, these are the same dynamics we are seeing in African countries. Uh, if you look at it from the perspective of someone like myself who lives in the United States, 
you know, some of the closest allies that the U.S. government has in Africa, um, Ethiopia, Egypt, Uganda, Nigeria, also witnessed some of the largest popular uprisings. And in most cases, to, to my dismay, uh, these uprisings were crushed with American weapons. Right. And so I think there's a, a way in which we need to sort of move past the older paradigm of Western saviorism. We need to stop thinking uh, that our task as, as people outside of Africa is to go in and, and save them by offering our sort of enlightened models of how to be better. Right. Um, but what Africa does need is solidarity. And that is uh, something that I think all of the activists have, have consistently communicated. There are ways in which we need to humble ourselves uh, and be willing to exchange ideas and recognize that these are common challenges, that global capitalism uh, has increasingly become predatory, uh, that there is this emergence of a global elite uh, who are coming from Nigeria, who are coming from Angola, who are coming from India, who are coming from China, who are coming from the US, and who seem to share a, a common set of values uh, in terms of how they consistently fear populist energies. Uh, we see that very much in the United States, where I've just come from. And so I think, you know, at this moment, uh, more than ever, you know, we need to stop being guilty about the old ways of doing things and really start to think about what new possibilities are, right? I keep trying to emphasize that one of the most important things that protest does is it increases our, our, our capacity to imagine new futures, right? Uh, and that goes for Africans as well as it does for the rest of us. And I think that we have dropped the ball in terms of engaging with African social movements in the contemporary period. And there's much that we can learn for our own countries, but also for the health of the planet as a whole, uh, if we were to take more seriously the kind of questions and conversations that, that these activists have been having. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm looking to that smartphone, <laughs> sorry, just because there's someone from the live stream who is who is watching the live streaming of this discussion who has a question to the panelists. And it's not about Africa, but it's about Syria. What do you here on the panel think on the, on the situation in Syria from a movement of people fighting for democracy? It turned into a bloody war. Um, what do we learn from the Syrian experience? What is your perspective on that if compared to the risks of repression that could happen also in other countries where people are rising up? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I believe uh, uh, the, the situation in Syria is very, very, very confused, actually. It's confused. There's a lot of violence uh, happening. We had, uh, it's a sub-region which was already problematic. Uh, it's mixed with religion and so. Uh, in Africa, Either, either you have a movement which is non-violent like they did in, uh, in Senegal, Burkina Faso, like we did in Burundi, uh, and you, you have to control it. We could have ended up, we had one, 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 one person was killed like uh, uh, three or five days the, the, when the demonstration started because it was, it was a popular movement. A uh, young boy was killed by demonstrators and then we obliged the leaders and we told them, we made all the declarations saying that the, person, the, the people who killed him had to be arrested and, and, the, and, to, and be punished. And then we obliged everybody that there was, it was a nonviolent movement. When, whenever you don't control it, whenever you let the, because you have, you have what you wish, what you want, the way you want things to go, and you can have a new leader coming from nowhere trying to recuperate the, the movement uh, with some, some, some other ways of. Uh, some other visions uh, different than yours. So th the movement can end up in violence, but you can also manage and have the courage to, to, to educate people, to tell them, to ha have local leaders who says no to violence. Uh, it's possible to have a movement, and uh, it's, it's not a fatality to, to end up like Syria. Mm. Maybe the question was also in the sense of um, it was a local movement, and then it turned into an, an international war. <coughs> Uh, from my own perspective, what's happened in Syria is the visible part of the iceberg. So, and uh, Bashar al-Assad used to be the friend of Bush, the friend of all those leaders who, for me, what's happened in Syria is not worse than what's happening in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, in, in, in Israel and Palestine. In Palestine. It's not worse than what's happening in, 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 in Congo when they killed five million people. Five million people, two million were kids, were, un, were under 20 years old. So which means that the people who created that situation, the chaos in Syria, want the world to talk about that issues 
this moment. That's the, that's the thing. That's the reality. There is a little group of people who lead the debate out the street. Whatever they want, people discuss about it in the media or whatever, that's what's going to happen. Because those people, they, they, they manipulate the media, the main, most of the mainstream media, and show fake information. We know about Iraq. French regret to attack Iraq. United States organized that with Bush and say that Iraq, they have like a, a bomb and whatever like that, whatever they have. They, that was the pretext to bomb there and store their oil. And it happened in a lot of countries. It happened a lot. So when they want to give credit to their war or to their, to their whatever happened in this world, they manipulate the media to show it the way that they want the world accept it. And the world say, oh, poor Syrians. Oh, I'm not saying that that's not something happening there. If there is so whatever happened in Syria is a shame for the world. That's a fail of the organization like EU, like EU, like UN, like all those organizations who can handle anything. Taking our monies, taking our whatever we want, and just talking, talking too much, they don't resolve any problem really. So that's the fail of this system, the worldwide system, which is mean that some people will still stay on the power on the top, some little country will decide for the rest of the world. Now we are talking here, good issues, real issues, at the same time the G20 summit with, is happening now in Berlin. And I'm sure they talk about nonsense there. And then tomorrow they will bring out something, a new policy, and lead the world. And lead the world and we all follow like dumb, deaf, and blind. We're not going to accept that anymore. Bashar al-Assad, you have to stop killing your people. But United States, South, uh, Saudi Arabia, France militaries, you have to quit the country. That, that country is independent. That's occupied. That's the reality. That's what I believe about that. Thank you. I, w I would suggest that um, if there's no immediate question, we... <laughs> Two last questions. Ah, three last questions. Okay, and then... Then we stop the discussion and we continue with uh, Coke and uh, Brezel or something like that. And I will introduce the other activists to you. Do you want to start? Ah, okay, start you're on the other yeah, side. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed. I was born in Senegal. There are you. Uh, my, my question, I, I was born in Senegal but raised up in the Gambia. And then my question to chat is that yeah, I want to ask you uh, uh, after 22 years of dictatorship rule in the Gambia, which was end up just last 1st of December, do you think uh, Gambian people, what type of uh, strategy they used to end up that dictatorship? Or do you think that your movement, because I heard about it, does it influence more in the Gambia and in the support of West African uh, bloc ECOMOC? Uh, what role do you see that uh, they play uh, in terms of the success of the oppression or the overthrow of the dictatorship regime in the Gambia. Thank you. Okay. We'll collect the other questions yes. before. Uh, the two other questions were over there. Um, yeah, I have also one question. Um, my name is Grit, and um, one thing is to organize a social movement like you like you described how you did it in your countries, and it's massively impressive what you are doing. And the other thing is like to organize a, an opposition, like a formal a formalized opposition in form of parties. So I want I wanted to ask you whether. Um, you could imagine for yourself to create a party in your own countries or whether you still believe in an opposition, in an organized opposition um, so that there is a field of different parties which could be an alternative to the, to the actual um, government in your countries. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question, there's a gentleman. Hi, um, my name is Ian. I'm uh, South African, so uh, I'm just going to mention maybe uh, that I know about Zimbabwe's situation, for example, um, and uh, I know that it's got a similar um, 
it's got similar problems to South Africa be, due to its history and whatnot. Uh, the only difference is that South Africa still has quite a, a large, um, uh, or rather, it's still quite dominated by um, a lot of Europeans. Um, uh, and uh, even some of the languages in South Africa are actually, or some of the official level, uh, actually two of the official languages are English and Afrikaans, Afrikaans being a, a language that uh, comes from Belgium, a small part of Belgium. Uh, I think it's the Flemish people that speak this language. Um, would, you, would you think it would be a bad idea to actually um, remove these two languages from the, from, um, the law to allow South Africans, or rather people of Afri African heritage to actually get ahead and um, make all the other uh, other people learn African languages instead. Yeah, that's my that's my okay. question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ah, okay. So there's one question from outside, which fits with the questions. Uh, one question to chat: How do you want to change society without participating in political institutions? So it's about the same question. Um, I still would like to give the question to Linda first about the po political parties because I heard that Linda might have presidential ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no necessity to create a party for that. <laughs> Um, there was a very interesting question about political parties, and I'll respond about political parties in the Zimbabwean perspective. Currently, as I am seated here, Zimbabwe has got more than 100 political parties which want to contest in the 2018 elections for a population of less than 15 million people. So naturally, most Zimbabweans no longer have faith in these political outfits because they're just like replicas of the current oppressors. They just want to get into power so that they keep on doing what the current oppressor is doing. The very same way Mugabe came into power and perfected the art of oppression, of, of Smith's oppression, is the very same thing that is happening. Because if all the leaders of these 100 political parties were really interested in developing and transforming Zimbabwe, that would have had formed a meaningful coalition long back, but it is a reality that all these political party leaders are only interested in attaining power, possibly for perfecting the current oppression regime in Zimbabwe. So the best bet for Zimbabwe right now is independent candidacy and the social movements which are united and which have managed to unite the divided Zimbabweans. So in the Zimbabwean context, I think political parties have failed and social movements are the only hope that Zimbabweans have right now because they've got a cause and they have a Zimbabwe that they envision, a democratic Zimbabwe, free, just, where rule of law is observed because right now uh, all the institutions in Zimbabwe Zimbabwe are captured. The judicial sector is captured, the state is captured, and Zimbabwe is a police state. So the only hope is us. We are the hope for Zimbabwe. Our brains are our hope because we don't have weapons and we don't believe in violence, and we believe that a new Zimbabwe is possible and that peace is possible. And, and then the question to chat about political participation without uh, being member of a party? Uh, I mean, first, everything is politics. Well, everything is politics. So uh, either is you are doing it to, to be elected in something, or you are doing it to participate in the way that you want to change something surrounding you. So for me, my own perspective, I don't want to be in a political party, because for me, the system is not the right thing that we want. Because mostly in the political party, there is just one man who think, one man who bring his, his money in Africa. I don't know how it's working here. But there is one leader forever. <coughs> and whatever he decide, that's what everybody will follow. Because he got the money, he got the power. So I don't like that system. And uh, I think movements like Yanamar are changing things without being in politics. We are already changing things. So why do we change the way that 
we are using to change things and join the way that we are criticizing. It doesn't make sense for me. So we don't need to be in politics to change something in our country. As you, as for me, um, somebody, uh, th there is a big debate in, in our movement. Uh, now that um, we have the law uh, who allow independent people to go to, uh, to, uh, to the parliament, independent people. Some people, they say that, okay, you can play soccer, you can play football in front of your house. It's possible. With the ball, you can play. But there is a stadium allowed to play football. It's just for play, playing football. Why don't you go play football in the stadium then? That's, the, that's what some people are saying. It's people who defend that we should go in politics. But people who don't believe that we should go in politics, what they're saying is, yes, there is the game, okay? Uh, Dortmund against Bayern Munich. At the half time, the referee come back on the pitch with the jersey of Bayern Munich and play the game. <laughs> so we are like in the middle of those two things. What I know is my own perspective, my own point of view. I don't need to be in politics to change things. Politics never changed anything since I was born. We need a new system. At least, or we change the, new, the system of the politics that we have now to have better situation. Mm. And for my brother talking about Gambia, um, I was involved, Liana Mar was involved in Gambia, in what's happening. We never been in Gambia because nobody invited us there because the strike or the protest was happening outside of Gambia, like in the uh, Gambian embassy in Dakar or in London. I even uh, say, uh, you, uh, Yaya must go in, 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 uh, in front of uh, the Union, Union of Nations in New York. Uh, there was a protest with Gambian people there. I, I was there with them saying, Yaya must go, Yaya must go. So we support Gambia a lot. And then now, in Yanamar, we have a program called Mboka. You know Mboka is Wolof. Ga in Senegal, we say Mbok. In Gambia, they say Mboka. It, that's the same word, but they, because of their English accent, they don't say Mbok, they say Mboka. <laughs> so then Mboka means my brother, family. So with that program, we're going to go a lot to Gambia and, and create it like the spirit of Yanamar with the rappers who exist already there, activists already there. Some of them is Killer Ace which is very well known about the protest that he did during, during the protest against Yaya Jame. And it's, it's about collecting the bloggers, the Gambian bloggers, the Gambian journalists who, who go back to the country after Yaya Jame is gone, and some, 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 some just leaders of the civil society in Gambia to, to keep uh, watch, being the watchdog of the kind of democracy that they start having in Gambia, because it's not yet democracy. But it's a kind of, it's the, the beginning of something. We have to protect the beginning of something that we have in Gambia. And I think the diaspora have a very important role to play about that. And Gambians who was, who ex, who was in exile should go back. Like Ethiopians also who was in exile should go back. Because we need them on the field. We need them in Africa, not outside. We need their help. We need them to see how we can change things from the field, from Africa. So Gambia is our interest, and we will go there soon. Um, Fadel was there uh, like uh, two weeks ago, and then Killer Ace launched his new movement, and we're going to have the Mboka in, in Gambia and to see how we can interact, how we can uh, exchange strategies to keep the, the democracy that they are starting to have alive. Because we, you know that um, the new president, uh, the, the government that he chose is not the one that we expect. He lost the election, the local ones, you know, so he might lost the next election. That's good in democracy. He didn't get all the power to handle however he want. That's good. And, and there is not good representing of the, the Gambians in, in the government and the National Assembly because Gambians are m in majority under 35 years old. So we need more young people involved in terms of like being in the parliament and being in in the institutions and handle the country because it's a very young country but very important country. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That's true for the rest of Africa yes. too, I think. Then there was the last question uh, about abolishing uh, English and Africans from South Africa or maybe we can put it more general, abolishing uh, colonial languages. No, no, no. You should 
you should ask here if no, no one wants to learn Zulu in Zosa, then you create schools and you bring them, they go learn Zulu and Zosa. But I think Africa need to speak all languages. So there's no matter, even if it's a language of the ex-oppressors, our kids need, you know, communication is the, the best thing. So you can't, you can't start to, to, to abolish this or that, but uh, here I think some people want to learn uh, Zulu or Swahili. If you want, we will come and they will take the revenge on that. That's what I think about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead, Linda. Linda wanted to say. Uh, okay, I, w I just want to answer to my brother in South Africa. Um, I've been in South Africa a lot of times, and um, the native languages are actually more used than English. Um, and besides, English is an international language. It makes us interact. Imagine if we were here and we couldn't speak Dutch. How, how are we going to be actually presenting uh, Iria right in front of the people? I, I, I think it is a bit um, insensitive for us to try and say English should, should be removed from our countries because as far as I'm concerned, it is the international language of communication. And if we try to eradicate it, it means that we're going to fail to communicate as a global village. Thank you. I was going to want to add, <laughs> I think we, we get our brother wrong in somehow because he was not saying that we get rid of the language definitely. He was saying that developed the traditional and local languages to exchange with inside of the country. That's what he was saying. If I, that's what I understand. Oh, yeah. okay. and, and, and for me also, I think the way that they impose us English or French or Dutch, we can impose the rest of the world Zulu or Swahili. <laughs> if we create our own computer, if we create our own cars with the GPS speaking Zulu, <laughs> and with, with our own all of that here happening here, and close our border, not just because we don't want anybody here, but close our border just five years, I'm telling you, Germans will run and migrate in, in Africa like uh, illegally. I'm telling you. <laughs> we could develop a lot of stuff. That was a joke. As well. <laughs> So we are looking forward to this invention. <laughs> Thanks a lot to, the, to my four panelists here. You were great. Thanks a lot. Thank you to the audience. You were great too. You were so interested. And um, I, hope, I hope it was not only patience but real interest. I wanted to thank the technicians and the interpreters as well. And And I wanted to say thank you to um, Claudia and Claudia Simons and Maria Kinn from the Heinrich Böll uh, Foundation who organized this evening and the workshop. And I want to say thank you to Audrey, who is participating in the workshop too. She's a journalist with Deutsche Welle, and she will try to promote the networking tomorrow. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to invite the one, two, three, four. The four, uh, the four activists who are in the first row, so that the audience can know your faces if ever they have questions uh, to ask you. So please, Fred, s'il te plaît, Fred. Fred is um, is coming from Goma in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. You don't have to leave, huh? <laughs> you can stay. <laughs> <laughs> He, he is one of the leaders of the youth movement uh, Lucha, Lut pour le changement, fight for change or ca combat for change. Um, he wants to raise awareness amongst young people and wants them to be actors of their own future. So I think he has the same objectives as the other activists here on stage. Then I wanted to call Eric, Eric Topona, who is a colleague of mine. Um, <laughs> He comes from, from Chad. In his professional life, he's a journalist and very neutral. And in his private life, he's an activist. <laughs> and uh, he, um, he has to flee his country because he had been put into prison, f because uh, he had been charged with, subversive, with writing of subversive online articles, which wasn't true. But anyway, he had to flee his country because uh, it's, very, it's a very repressive country. Um, then another colleague of mine, Tesfalem Valdez, um, who is coming from Ethiopia. 
He's one of the bloggers of the Zone 9 bloggers, very famous movement in Ethiopia. Um, and he had to flee uh, as well because he had been put into prison just for writing his opinion in blogs and newspapers. And then, last but not least, <laughs> Emery Wright from Atlanta in, uh, in the USA, Georgia. <laughs> He's the co-director of Project South, the Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide. And he has been working for the last 20 years on um, community organizing, movement buildings, etc. And so he has lots of interesting experience. So now you know the faces. Now you, we can go to... <laughs> uh, excuse me, I, I would like, I would like uh, personally to thank Eric Tobona. Uh, I spent 15 months of clandestinity in Burundi. Uh, Eric knew through Deutsche Welle that I was inside the country. Nobody knew where I was. He was calling me like every two, three days to know if I am alive. Uh, he was doing his best to, to, to talk about Burundi on Deutsche Welle. And I would like to thank that radio and Eric, and, uh, please. Thanks a lot for that compliment for my colleague. <laughs> um, so now we can share a Coke and a Brezel or some water, and you can ask the rest of your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you for you.